Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a programmer and an artist, and today I wanted to share some thoughts I have about the vector math node, um, which I think is sort of one of the most basic nodes. If you counted up how many times I've used different nodes in all of my different node setups I've made, I wouldn't be surprised if the vector math node is the one that I've used the most. If it's not that, it's probably just a regular math node. But before I get into the vector math node, I wanted to go over some higher level concepts and sort of talk about why I picked the vector math node as a starting point. The reason I decided to make a video about this is because I've gotten comments on a number of other videos either saying something along the lines of, wow, you're really good at geometry nodes, or um, I could never do that. I, I've tried to use geometry nodes, but it's too complicated. I don't know where to start. So my hope with this video is to address some of that, hopefully make things a little bit clearer, and, and to give my recommendation of where I think might be a good place to start. So I guess how I might try to explain that is, you could imagine you're going to try to build a house, right? And if you just try to build a house, you don't know where to start. There's too many things to do. And it's sort of the same with geometry nodes. If you want to make a geometry node setup that does whatever, fill in the blank, that's probably too complicated. It might need, you know, a hundred nodes or something. So then you have to break that big idea of, say, the house into its smaller components. So you might say, well, we need a foundation and we need walls and we need, you know, plumbing and electrical and we need a roof and different things. And those are the smaller tasks that make up the, the bigger task of building the house. So then if you take all those smaller tasks in the node group, those might be you know sub nodes nodes within a lot you might have a, a big node that does some complicated thing but then inside of that node group there might be smaller node groups that do simpler tasks and then inside of that smaller node group with simpler tasks you could have individual nodes right so then if you're building a wall that might be broken into the tasks of like measuring and cutting and attaching a board with nails or you know something along those lines but then that small task of measuring or cutting is repeated across a bunch of the larger tasks so you you're going to measure when you're framing you're going to measure when you're doing the sheeting you're going to measure when you're building the roof you're going to measure when you're building just about anything so then you could kind of say that the smaller the task becomes if you're just measuring you can apply that task to a lot of different applications but it doesn't do all that much by itself you know you can if you just measure, you're not actually getting anything done, you're just finding out some information. So then you could go and you could put together some measuring and cutting and attaching and say this way of measuring and cutting and attaching makes a wall. So now you've made a larger task out of the really small tasks, but that larger task can't be used to make the roof because that's done differently. Even though you're still measuring and cutting and attaching using all of the same subcomponents, you're doing it in a slightly different way. So my advice would be, you should get really good at measuring and cutting and attaching. And once you do that, you'll be able to build your walls and you'll be able to build your roof and, you know, whatever it is you want to do. Because those low-level skills apply to all of the other things. So what is measuring and cutting and, att and attaching in the context of geometry nodes? And I'd say that's probably the vector math node, being able to manipulate points, move them around in relation to other points and things like that. And then also, I guess, along with that, being able to, you know, use the regular math nodes and work with the data of the mesh that's all arranged in arrays by index, you know, learning different ways that you can make selections from different parts of the geometry, and then that in combination with just the set position node and vector math to be able to to be able to describe the relationship between different points, whether you're subtracting them from each other to get directions or adding them together to offset things. And then once you have that building block, it's just what input geometry are you feeding into that um, to transform it in some way. So that's your input geometry or your curves or distributing points across the faces or instancing objects on those points. You know, all of that are just different ways of inputting geometry into something that you're eventually going to want to transform probably with a vector math node. There are a ton of other things you can do, obviously, but I'd say that's a key part of a lot of your use cases for geometry nodes. Which kind of brings me to one other point I wanted to make real quick before we dive into the vector math, which is what makes something a good geometry node setup? One way you could define a geometry node setup as being a good geometry node setup is by saying, well, the thing that it makes is really cool. And I think that's a fine definition. I've definitely made lots of geometry node setups that just do something cool. But I think a better metric might be how reusable the setup is. Um, because essentially when you make a procedural geometry node setup, what you're doing is automating some process that you would otherwise have to do manually. And so the more you can automate the processes that you need to do over and over again, the more time you should save by investing the time in making that geometry node setup 
because you'll be able to skip over some of the time of making it manually every time you need to do it in the future because you have this setup that does it procedurally. So I guess what I'm advocating is hopefully reflected also in my geometry node assets. It's like start with the vector math node, then combine a few of those together and make a node that just bends a curve or shortens a curve or you know does something very simple and then you can take that node and another node that you know does something equally simple and combine them together and you make a node that's a bit more complicated and then once you start having those more concrete tools that you know actually make a tree or something well then you can combine it together like the example I gave the other day and make a forest really fast instead of making a node group that makes a forest what I essentially did was made something that can spawn a curve and then make something that can select parts of that curve and then spawn curves on those curves you know those are all individual node groups and then there was and then there's another node group that defines you know the radius and then you combine all of that together and you have you know your trunk and branch generators and then your leaf generators and you combine all of those together and you have a tree generator and then you take the tree generator together with the collection scatter node and now you have your forest generator but it's a it starts small so hopefully that makes sense as far as sort of my general thought process when approaching a geometry nodes project. So then because I think it's sort of a fundamental building block, I wanted to talk about the vector math node. I wanted to go over addition and subtraction, um, multiplication and scaling, and then potentially the cross product and dot product, as well as going over how I think about the vectors and visualize them in my head when I'm um, trying to solve a problem with geometry nodes. Along the lines of sort of simplifying the problem of, you know, building the house down to measuring and cutting, when I'm thinking about a particular operation I want to do in geometry nodes, I usually try to simplify it down to where I'm thinking about vertex A and vertex B, you know, or face A and face B. If you can simplify it to where you're just thinking about two example elements and how they relate to each other, it's a lot easier to, you know, assign them arbitrary values and think about how the math for that might work out. So how do I think about a vector? Um, the way I think about a vector is that it's an arrow and it points from the origin of the world, so 0, 0, like at the 3D cursor here, to some point. And if you move that point around, that arrow will always adjust to reach to that point. I'd say an arrow is the primary way I think about it. Um, you can also think about it as a line. I do that sometimes, especially if it's between two points, and I don't really care about any directionality for it. Um, it can also just be a point in space uh, without the arrow to it, but it's still there's still an arrow from the origin of the world to that point. So those would, I'd say, be the, sort of the three ways I primarily think about vectors. So either a point, an arrow from zero to that point, or a line, which is usually how I think of it when I'm thinking about the relationship between two points or two vectors. So then I guess the question would be, how does visualizing a vector as an arrow help you solve problems? And I would say that once you visualize it as an arrow, you can manipulate it and transform it around. Uh, you can imagine it on a plane or a piece of paper and you can slide that arrow around. So then once you're imagining this arrow in 3D space, you could imagine transforming it in some different ways. So your basic ones might be, you know, scaling it up and down or moving it around or rotating it. Or you could take several arrows and draw um, arrows between the ends of those arrows or, you know, chain them together in some way. And the way you can do all of those things is with the vector math node and the different modes it can operate in. So the first one we might talk about is the scale operation because it does exactly what it says. It scales the vector. So I have this node set up. Um, it's just a point in 3D space, which is defined by this empty A, which I can move around. And then that just draw, and then I just have this node group that draws an arrow from zero to that point. So we can manipulate that point by scaling it. And the, we're going to scale it with a vector math node, and we're going to scale it using the Y position of our controller here. So if we slide that controller down to zero, you can see the arrow gets shorter until it's exactly on top of itself. And if you scale it up past one, then it will extend in the same direction further than the point that we have defined with our empty here. So that's what scaling does. You can imagine it as stretching or lengthening and shortening the arrow. I guess another one we should mention is the normalize operation on the vector math node, because it's kind of like scaling, um, but it will scale the vector no matter how long it is, to be exactly one unit in length. So if we just set this to normalize here, you can see it gets shorter. If I drag this over here, you can see it reaches to exactly one meter on the grid. 
And no matter how you rotate it, it will always be one meter long, but it will point towards the original point of the input vector. So the second operation I think we should talk about is addition. And to do that, we'll need a second vector. So we have our red vector and our blue vector, and they both reach to different points here. And then if we were to add those together, we would get a third vector, which is the sum of them. And that would look like this. And, it, and so you can see if you move the either one of these around, the yellow line changes and points in different directions. So how could you predict what the yellow line was going to do based on the red and the blue lines? And the answer to that is you take either one of them and then you move the first one so that it starts from the end of the other one. And if you do that and follow a path through the blue vector and then through the red vector, where you end up is the yellow vector because you're combining them together. And you could do that the other way as well. You could move the blue vector to the end of the red vector and it would point to the end of the yellow vector. So the result of a vector addition is essentially the same as stacking a bunch of arrows end to end to end. And the result of all of the, the path of all of those arrows is the sum of those vectors. And then I guess one other thing to point about, out about addition is just like when you're adding two numbers together, it doesn't matter if you add four to two or two to four, you still get six either way. It's the same with vectors. So if you put the, the blue vector to the end of the red vector, you still get to the end of the yellow vector. Same if you put the red vector to the end of the blue vector. So if you swap which socket those two are plugged into, you still get the same result. But that is not the case when you do subtraction, just the same as when you subtract two numbers from each other. So let's switch these vector math nodes on our yellow arrow to subtraction instead of addition. And we get this result. And you can see now if we swap the order of those sockets, the arrow points in the opposite direction. So then the question is, how can you visualize what happens when you subtract two vectors from each other? And the answer is that you essentially get a direction vector that could connect the two endpoints of the input vectors. And you can see that if I move the yellow result vector to the end of the red vector, it ends up exactly at the end of the blue vector. Another way to think about it is the same way as addition, but before you add the two vectors, you reverse the direction of one of the vectors and then stack it on top of the other one. And the result of that is your yellow direction vector. But generally the way I think about it is that subtraction creates a result that connects the end of the red vector to the end of the blue vector. Or more realistically, I'm not even thinking about them being the end of the red vector and the end of the blue vector, but rather they're just points A and B, and the yellow vector is the vector that connects point A to point B. Or they could move point A to point B if you added it to it. And so we can see how that could work here. I've gone into the red arrow, and if we subtract point A from point B, and then we scale that to zero, and then we add that to the vector we have already. So we're stacking, so we're stacking this new vector we've created that's the result of the subtraction that will is identical to our yellow arrow onto the end of our red arrow. So it should describe this motion here. So we can see that here as we increase the scale, it moves straight to the end of the blue vector when it's set to one and points all along back to zero. So here we've combined the addition with the subtraction with the scale to be able to, to essentially create a value you could animate to slide a point along that yellow line. So I think that essentially covers how I think about addition and subtraction and multiplication or scaling. Uh, you can also multiply by a vector, which is a little bit different, but sort of the same concept as multiplying by a float, which is the scale operation. So I think that's enough for this one. Um, in a follow-up video, hopefully I can get into the cross product and dot product operations of the vector math node, because I think those are also very useful ones to understand how they work. But I think this is enough for this one. Um, so hopefully you found that interesting. If, I, if there's anything that I explained in a confusing way, uh, feel free to ask in a comment. Um, I try to make it as simple and visual as possible. This is how I think about it. Um, like I said, try to, to try to simplify the problem to where you're considering two points and how they relate to each other. And then you can just draw arrows between them in, in your mind and think of different ways that you could push them around. And then if that's something that you can do generally across the entire mesh, um, well, you can use the set position mode to do that and transform the, all of the vertices in the mesh based on you know a rule that when you were solving it, you were just considering you know the two points which makes it easier to think about. So hopefully this was interesting and informative and um, helped you think about vectors in a visual way.
If um, you have questions, feel free to ask. And um, other than that, that's all I've got for this one. Thanks for watching.